thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. So uh, yes, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, the focus of today's talk is life cycle assessment and how we can utilize this um, tool to really drive the change to more circular economies and to actually deliver uh, sustainable change in, in the world around us. So just an overview of what the presentation will cover. First, we'll start with the with a summary of um, the approach that CRODA has taken towards uh, life cycle assessment and the tool that we have developed in support of this. Um, and then I'll be presenting three case studies of three different um, LCAs we've performed to um, either demonstrate the sustainability benefits of our ingredients or identify opportunities for stakeholder, collabor stakeholder collaboration and targeted action outside our factory gates. Um, but also um, a study that has ramification for our um, upstream activities and how really we select our raw materials and our feedstock to improve the environmental performance of our ingredients. And lastly, we'll um, conclude with really how we can use LC data to drive uh, business and societal value. Um, so first, um, just, just a bit about CRODA to kind of uh, build the context of why LCA is, is relevant for us. Um, so we are um, a customer-focused manufacturer of um, innovative, naturally-based specialty chemicals, and we operate in personal care and the life sciences markets. And consumers may not know our name, but every day, uh, millions of people, people throughout the world uh, use products containing our ingredients. So anything from detergents and shampoos to crop treatments and vaccines. And despite the broad range of ingredients that we manufacture, sustainability underpins how we think commercially and is the uh, biggest driver of our strategy. Um, our raw material footprint is predominantly bio-based. Uh, in 2022, almost 60% of our raw materials um, were derived from renewable crops. Um, or biotechnology. And our commitment is to be the world's most sustainable supplier of innovative ingredients, um, becoming climate, land, and people positive by 2030. And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are at the foundation of our approach. So as part of our strategy, um, a, a pivotal element, element of, of, of our 2030 sustainability agenda is um, our uh, product stewardship uh, target to complete full life cycle assessments or cradle to grave life cycle assessments for our top 100 ingredients. Um, so this means going beyond just the minimum requirements for compliance and it, it involves building upon the knowledge we gain from regulations such that ultimately we fully understand the impact of our products beyond our factory gate. So to this extent, we'll use life cycle assessment to map out the environmental hotspots of our products and prioritize new and more efficient solutions and also to chart new paths because when developing new technologies or improving current technologies, it's important to know where to focus efforts for the most meaningful uh, environmental improvements. And ultimately, through LCAs, um, will help the market, market in which we operate move towards more circular economies and um, reduce the consumer and employee exposure to chemical hazards. Um, so what is life cycle assessment? Uh, I know it's, it's a term that um, across the industry has been uh, talked about more and more. It's definitely a hot topic. However, um, it, it's perceived as, a, as an academic tool and there's quite some resistance towards it because of its complexity. So hopefully I'll, I'll try to break it down for you in, in simple terms. Um, really, LCA is just a methodology that's designed to help businesses to um, measure and quantify the environmental um, impact of a product or a process or a service. Um, so that it, the methodology is looking throughout the entire um, life cycle of the product. So it means we're modeling the impact of raw materials, energy, water, waste that is produced not just at the manufacturing, so within our own gate, but uh, also in the life uh, cycle stages upstream and downstream for us all the way uh, to the end of life. And then we quantify these impacts um, in terms not of just carbon emissions, um, but we're looking at a broad suite of environmental indicators like resource depletion, ecotoxicity, and many, many others. Um, and the core methodology we've chosen for our LCA approach is the product environmental footprint methodology developed by the European uh, Commission, which aims to be the really the overarching framework um, for performing LCAs and for selling 
product into the European market with, with an LCA. Um, so um, there's really two ways, um, two different system boundaries that we can take in an LCA study. So if we wanna just focus on the elements within a company's direct control, we can perform a cradle to gate LCA. So it's looking at the upstream activities and the manufacturing within um, our own direct operations or take the full cradle to grave um, approach that is looking downstream from the company at the impacts uh, associated with the distribution, the further processing stages, the use of the end product and the end of life. Um, so obviously through the um, case studies that I'll be sharing, you, you'll see the, the, the benefits of going for the full cradle to grave approach rather than just the cradle to gate. So we'll be expanding on that in a bit. Uh, however, regardless of, of the system boundary that we choose, um, there's always a four stage process to, to an LCA study. And, and it starts first with uh, setting the goal and scope um, of the LCA. So why is it that we want to perform that study? Um, is it to satisfy customer requests for data? Is it to um, help with our own corporate reporting? Is it to drive innovation? And then who do we want to, who is the audience for this study? Who are we going to share it with? Um, also, what type of data we'll be using, what are the constraining parameters, what are the assumptions we need to make, what's the baseline year, the geography that we'll focus on. Um, all these key um, elements will have to be first covered in the goal and scope, and then that dictates the entire course of, of, of the process of the data collection and the results that we generate. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, next steps are the inventory analysis and really the, the impact assessment. And at all stages, you know, there's elements of interpretation. Um, so why do cradle to grave rather than uh, cradle to gate LCA? Well, the main benefit is of using cradle to grave LCA is that it avoids burden shifting, which is the transfer or impacts from one life cycle stage to another. So a clear example of that is, for example, um, how our scope one and two emissions uh, um, become basically the upstream scope three emissions of our customer. So by taking a, a full cradle to grave approach, we make sure that um, we don't just target the impact within our own, own direct operations and then kind of um, you know push push the ball further down the road for it to be someone else's problem. Um, also, the other main benefit of doing um, cradle to grave LCAs is that it avoids uh, trade-offs. So uh, what that means is, you know, when you complete the, uh, an LCA, the business will be more better equipped to make difficult strategic and um, tactical sustainability decisions that take into account um, any trade-offs among a broad range of factors that otherwise might be deemed irreconcil irreconcilable. Um, so, for example, if we want to focus on lowering the carbon footprint by switching to a different uh, raw material, we need to make sure that the raw material we're switching to doesn't involve more land being used um, or more water being used um, in, in its uh, manufacturing. Um, and also, as you can see here, our strategy and everyone, every company's strategy will involve um, elements beyond carbon will involve considerations around nature, around water, around uh, persistence and biodegradability, which impact different stages of the product's life cycle. And with nowadays, you know, with companies' um, ambitions to become net zero, uh, net nature positive, and so on, it can be quite difficult to um, grasp really what can we do to achieve all these different goals. So um, a cradle to grave LCA really makes sustainability more tangible. Um, it brings all the different work streams under one concrete um, project, if you want. And um, also cradle to grave LCAs, by doing everything that they do, they pinpoint where investment and innovation and change are needed in the value chain to generate the maximum business and environmental value. So it allows us to make the decisions based on the true impact of changes. You know, we can answer, is it worth to make the expensive and disruptive changes? Are the effort and money put in the right places to generate the net uh, environmental benefit? Um, now, of course, we can, in an ideal world where um, everyone did their, their part, uh, everyone was uh, performed LCAs, following a clear standard framework 
we should all be doing just cradle to gate LCAs and then share this with our um, stakeholders upstream and downstream from us and that will be enough. However, we're not there yet. So yes, if we only do, did cradle to gate LCAs, the results of these, they can support better purchasing decisions, uh, they can support optimization of the manufacturing process or transition to different raw materials or different designs um, and can progress towards many of our sustainability targets and doing all this while providing necessary data to satisfy customer requests. Because I want to emphasize that at the moment, when we get an LCA request, it's for a cradle to gate, LCA rather than a cradle to grave. Um, and oftentimes we get asked, why do we want to spend all the time and resource to assess a part of the value chain that is completely outside of our control? Um, but really, it's, it's all about seeing the, the true picture. Um, so in order to, to make uh, strategic decisions, um, things like deciding on how you want to steer your product portfolio in the future, uh, staying ahead of customer requests and market trends, really requires seeing the full picture so that we don't get blindsided by, by our customers during their, their bit and, and kind of uncovering something completely new to us. Um, and of course, by doing the cradle to grave, yeah, it involves working with, with uh, suppliers and customers and stakeholders all across the value chain, and it's aligned with the SDG 70 partnership for the goals. So our approach, Croda's approach um, to LCA was to take full of ownership of the LCA process and develop internal LCA expertise so that we fully understand um, the LCA results generated and we draw business value from them. Um, as I said, we have to complete 100 LCAs by the end of the decade, so we did not want to outsource LCA expertise and then end up with 100 LCA reports that we don't really understand or know what to do with and then risk this valuable data ending up in a drawer somewhere forgotten. So, um, and furthermore, our, our uh, products are quite complex. So relying on consultants to do this work uh, for us means really that some of this complexity around our products and the opportunities might not translate or reflect in the results. Um, so ultimately, we want the LCA work to drive innovation and to be used as a forecasting tool for new product development. So um, before we even get to the production stage, we, we know what's the best course of action. So owning the LCA process really means we can more easily incorporate all this consideration into product innovation. So as a result of, of that, uh, in 2021, we built a bespoke cradle to grave LCA tool in collaboration with the um, LCA specialists from uh, Ricardo. Um, and this tool, it confirms, confirms with um, all the relevant ISO standards. You see the two ISOs mentioned on the screen. Uh, it can be applied across multiple products uh, and across uh, different applications. Um, it adopts a wide system boundary um, that uh, can accommodate most reporting requirements. Um, right now, as I mentioned, we are using the, the PET methodology. So we are reporting on the 29 environmental indicators compri comprised by the PET methodology, but um, we can select which indicators to include. So we can incorporate the criteria that our clients may request um, and we have built in the flexibility to really expand and adopt, adopt additional requirements that may arise in the future as part of this tool. Um, and the tool, yeah, it, it identifies the hotspots in the life cycle of a product. It pinpoints the key stages and processes or materials that we need to target. And very importantly, it has a modular design. So it's very easily adaptable if we wanna do a comparative analysis where we maybe wanna um, assess the, the benefits of our product uh, compared with the counterfactual, um, or also if we want to model complex functional units uh, or look at, at different um, performance scenarios, again, we can do that more easily rather than just relying on, a, um, on softwares like SEMA Pro, uh, which of course are fantastic tools, but again, for, for, the, for drawing maximum value out of this process, we felt that we needed something a bit more um, designed for our needs. Um, so this brings me to the next point, the type of data that we use when um, performing an LCA study. 
I mentioned earlier, we need to collect energy, waste, water, information on the uh, materials that are being used in every process at each life cycle stage. And ideally, we want to get this data um, from primary sources. So any process within direct operations, it will be easy to get this data. Uh, and we are working, we are engaging with suppliers to, to get as much primary data um, for modeling the upstream life cycle stages. However, it's not always possible. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that the data that we need to perform the LC analysis is quite commercially sensitive. <laughs> so really, this kind of highlights the challenges um, the struggles around uh, getting to full supply chain transparency. And actually, it, it, it uh, showcases a, 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 an opportunity. Uh, so we can use LCA to educate our peers, our stakeholders, um, to, to kind of do these assessments on their own. And instead of sharing with us commercially sensitive information like their bill of materials, um, we can help them, we can upskill them to do same LC analysis and in the end just share with us a set of emission factors um, rather than all the information that is needed to uh, run the analysis and generate those emission factors. Um, so yeah, until we get to standardization and, and full transparency and data availability to other entire supply chain, um, we want to share best practice around LCA and we want to work with our suppliers and our customers and our peers to build LCA capabilities um, across the industry. Um, otherwise, um, without primary data, we are relying on a hy hybrid approach where you know, we use primary data where, where we can and then kind of ask our suppliers to, to share as much um, of their processes as they can. So for example, uh, if they use one process rather than the other, uh, or if they have some partial data, product carbon footprint or geography or feedstocks of their raw materials, um, and then combine that supplier specific information with uh, secondary data, um, literature, research literature available, or um, emission factors already included in um, LC databases like EcoInvent. Um, so there is there is quite a quite a long way to go until we can all kind of generate our own bit of LCA data and, and build this um, as part of the value chain. But it's definitely uh, the momentum is building um, around, around the opportunity that LCA represents. So it's the, the sooner we engage more across the, the business, the better. So moving on to the case studies, uh, the first case study um, is uh, looking at a biopolymer that Croda has designed to, to help with prolong the, the um, life of, of fabrics by preventing damage during washing and preventing coral, color loss and graying. And through this LCA, this was actually the first LCA that we've done. Um, and through it, we're uh, looking to demonstrate the sustainability benefits of this ingredient. Um, so yeah, the main question is, yeah, is there an environmental benefit to including this biopolymer in a fabric conditioner. So the biopolymer uh, that Croda makes, yeah, it, it's being uh, included in a fabric conditioner. And uh, we have primary data um, that confirms that clothes that have been washed with a fabric conditioner containing our biopolymer um, look like they've been washed half as often than compared to using a fabric conditioner without our biopolymer. Um, however, um, there's, quite a lot of consumer surveys like, like the RAP surveys from 2012 and 2016, which indicate that um, around 10% of the clothing um, is thrown away prematurely due to washing damage. So what that means is, although we know the performance of our product can lead to a double uh, in the lifetime of clothes, uh, actually, um, based on, on these on these wrap uh, surveys, it, it, we expect that using our product will um, improve, increase the lifetime of clothes by 10% compared with a system where a fabric conditioner without our um, biopolymer is being used. Um, so the LCA wanted to basically assess the net environmental benefits of incorporating this biopolymer in a fabric conditioner. 
um, and to measure really what are, what are the impacts within product control, as well as what occurs upstream and downstream for, for us, and then compare this with a fabric conditioner that does not contain biopolymer. Um, so this um, here is a, is a flow diagram showing the system boundary for the LCA study. So you can see each box represents a life cycle stage, represents a, a, a key flow in the life cycle that has been modeled. Um, upstream uh, life cycle stages are shown in amber within direct operations in, in green and then downstream in, in yellow, sorry, in yellow, in blue. Um, so wherever you see a box, we basically collected energy, raw material, waste, um, information that, to model those respective uh, processes. And um, overall, yeah, this is a cradle to grave assessment that um, has a, as a functional unit one wash of clothes. So what it means is the study reported all the results per one wash of clothes. And here are the key parameters um, that we've used to constrain this uh, functional unit. Um, as I said, it, it is a comparative study. So it's looking at a one wash of clothes using fabric conditioner with our biopolymer um, and one wash of clothes using a fabric conditioner without the biopolymer. And here it kind of explains what do we mean by one wash of clothes, how many kilograms of, of clothes, um, what the amount of electricity used by the washing machine, um, all these different parameters to make sure that we're comparing apples with apples. Um, and here are the results, the, the uh, cradle to grave impact. So previously I mentioned that the tool reports on 29 environmental indicators as part of the PET methodology. And now you can see all of these on the left hand side of the graph. So the colors on the graph represent stages of the biopolymer life cycle. Um, presented as part of the functional unit, one wash of clothes. Um, and you can see that these have been grouped into five big categories, so raw materials, manufacturing, transport, use, and end of life. So if we look at the environmental impact categories, you can see a lot of orange on this graph, which clearly shows that the hotspot lies downstream with the use phase, so the laundry washing. Um, and more exactly, the use phase is responsible for around 90, 93% of the overall impacts for all these um, environmental indicators. And we can further zoom in into any impact category. So for example, if we take uh, climate change, uh, we can analyze it in more depth. So here you can see that washing one uh, load of clothes with a fabric conditioner that contains the biopolymer is found to have a climate change impact of 2.22 kilograms of CO2 per wash. And furthermore, this impact arises predominantly from two sources in the use phase. Um, you can see from the graph, it's um, the washing machine electricity consumption um, represents nearly 50% of the total impact for one wash of clothes. And then the wearing out of clothes represents 20 to 22 to 24 percent of the total impact. So, um, and something to bear in mind, as the electricity grid decarbonizes across the entire world, really the, the relative importance of uh, the materials will increase. So the wearing out of clothes will become a bigger factor. What, um, what this means is that um, the environmental impact you see with, with the environment, with the wearing out of clothes will, will be greater. So the potential savings due to better garment protection um, through using fabric conditioners that, that maintain these uh, garments undamaged after washing is greater. And furthermore, we can isolate um, the, the impact associated with CRODA and our ingredient as part of the whole uh, one wash cycle with, with using the fabric conditioner and everything. And you can see 1% of the 2.2 kilograms of CO2 per wash is strictly allocate, allocated to CRODA in uh, our biopolymer and the raw materials required to make this biopolymer. So the implication of this, bearing in mind that all the impacts lie downstream, is that CRODA should continue to consider the in-use benefits of, of our products rather than focus solely on the direct emissions that we're causing with causing with our direct operations, because really the best way to reduce the impact is to tackle the use phase. Um, and as I said, we have compared the 
um, one wash of clothes using a fabric conditioner with our biopolymer with a counterfactual system where a fabric conditioner without our biopolymer is being washed. And the difference between these two systems is that with the use of the biopolymer, um, the um, life, uh, the longevity of the clothes is, is increased by, by 10% because that, that uh, damage during washing is being avoided. So people don't have to throw away the clothes that are being uh, damaged. Um, so what that means is really when we compare these two systems, there will be uh, an additional impact within the raw materials and manufacturing stages for, uh, our, for the system with our biopolymer, because we are creating an extra ingredient um, using extra raw materials and extra energy and everything. And more exactly when we're looking at the functional unit of one wash, producing our biopolymer increases the climate change impact uh, of fabric conditioner by three grams of CO2 per wash. However, when we look at the downstream stages where our product is delivering an increase in performance and is preventing clothes from being damaged during washing, uh, the system with our biopolymer avoids 50 grams of CO2 per wash um, because it prevents a close wear compared with a counterfactual. So that means the net benefit of, uh, of our novel biopolymer um, is 47 grams of CO2 per wash that is being saved um, because the life, uh, lifetime of clothes is, is being prolonged. And this ultimately means that um, a fabric conditioner containing our biopolymer used in the wash cycle will have a 2% lower climate change impact um, than the counterfactual. And in addition to the climate change impact, uh, the LCA compared the two systems across all the other 28 indicators and found that the system containing our biopolymer was preferable to the counterfactual system across all environmental indicators except for human toxicity um, in organics where neither system really reports a recordable impact. But for all the rest indicators, the biopolymer system is found to have a lower impact with the impact savings ranging from one to 8% with the greatest benefit recorded for water use. So you can see here the biggest difference between our system, which performs better, better in the control system is for water use. Um, now, a really great thing about, about BLCA is that we can test any uh, assumptions that we're making to really increase the confidence in the data that we're pre uh, presenting. So this can help companies to kind of uh, combat any claims of greenwashing. So remember I said that with the use of our biopolymer, um, the lifetime of, of garments is extended by 10%. However, this is based on, a, as I said, on a wrap study where consumers in Europe um, shared the reasons of why they disclose of clothes prematurely. However, if we're looking at a different geography, someone might, uh, might argue that, well, it could be that we extend the lifetime of clothes by less than 10%. So what then does our polymer, biopolymer still generate benefits in use? So because of that, we wanted to, to test really the confidence in, in the final conclusions of the study. So we've done a sensitivity analysis where we looked at different um, lifetime extension scenarios for the garments. Um, and again, because there is an environmental burden with producing our biopolymer, we wanted to see what is the tipping point at which producing our ingredient actually generates more impact than, uh, save the, than the savings downstream. And we found this to be 0.61%. So as long as our um, biopolymer, when using a fabric conditioner, extends the lifetime of the garments by a minimum, minimum of 0.61%, then we will be generating a net a saving in carbon and a net saving in water and all the other environmental indicators. So again, this, this, can, be, this can be used to, to show that even though we are building this study around assumptions, um, nonetheless, the conclusions remain the same. And furthermore, I mentioned, uh, based on the, on the data that we have, we know our biopolymer really can double the lifetime of clothes. Uh, we, you can wash clothes two, twice longer 
twice more many times than if you don't use a fabric conditioner with our biopolymer. However, only 10% of, of the uh, garment lifetime is being extended right now because of consumer behavior. So what that means is, although you can double the lifetime of clothes, um, people will still throw away clothes even if they're not damaged after washing. But quite a, a, an astonishing, uh, astounding um, percentage of people will throw away clothes because they don't fit anymore or because they don't like them. So what that means is our ingredients, our, our ingredient performance can um, double the lifetime of clothes, but at the moment, the performance of the product is limited by the consumer behavior. So assuming a scenario in which we work with the customer to um, improve, uh, to educate the consumer and change the, the, the habits around fast fashion, we modeled also a, um, a, best, yeah, a best case scenario to see what is the maximum performance that our uh, ingredient can generate. Um, and this is uh, a decrease from uh, 2.26 uh, when we don't use the biopolymer to 1.99 kilograms of CO2 per wash um, if the washes are actually doubled. Um, so really what this means is Croda is a business to business company. So we don't really have access to the, to the consumer. We're a few steps removed from the process, but um, through this study, we are able to provide our customers with the right tools to, to drive education among the consumers and change their habits to further maximize all the benefits that we can generate through the performance of our product. And ultimately, you know, the potential is instead of generating 2% reduction in carbon footprint when using um, the biopolymer on the current scenario, you can generate a 12% reduction in the carbon footprint per wash if the consumer does their part and if they are aware of the fact that throwing clothes just because you don't like them has a big impact. And, and stop by stopping to do that, you can generate quite a, a big change. Uh, the second case study is looking at an active ingredient which is used um, in an anti-aging cream. And the purpose of this case study is really to demonstrate how um, LCAs uncover opportunities for stakeholder collaboration and targeted action outside factory gates. So a bit similar with, with the previous LCA in the sense that uh, this is a, a product where the biggest impacts sit outside of our factory gate. But through the learnings of, of, of this study, uh, we're in a better position to engage with our customers um, and, and collaborate with them to, to maximize savings where they are needed most, which is downstream. Um, so the system boundary for, for this active ingredient it's here again, upstream uh, life cycle stages in amber, within direct operations in blue and downstream in, in green. Uh, so what happens is this active ingredient that we are manufacturing um, is, is manufactured using two key raw materials. Each raw material can be sourced from one of two processes. So process A and process B, as you can see, and then process B and process C for raw material too. And then um, once we manufacture the active ingredient, uh, we send it to our customer, which will incorporate our active ingredient into manufacturing an anti-aging cream, so the finished product. And then this is sent to the retailer, ends up with the consumer and it's being used. And we've modeled um, these activities for, uh, for the Western Europe market. And the study is looking at, uh, again, the functional unit is one application of cream. And the main question that we wanna ask answer is what is the environmental impact of this skin conditioning agent when it's being used as, as part of anti-aging facial creams and really what is the environmental burden of the different upstream processes because um, there are opportunities here to uh, move to a completely different process or either choose process A or process B or process B and process C so we just want to make sure that we're choosing um, the best option. And again, the, the key study parameters, I've uh, here the, the extent of actual numbers that I'll, I'm sharing with you, unfortunately is limited. So rather than figures, I'm sharing more the, the, the units that they represent again, because of the sensitive nature of, of, of the data. But you, you get the gist here, what are the, the key parameters with constraint to, to make sure when we say one application of cream and the impact per application of cream that we've considered the entire system. 
Um, and um, yes, so here are the impacts of one application of anti-aging cream across all the environmental indicators, so much like last time. And you can see these uh, impacts split by uh, different life cycle stages. And um, probably what strikes you is that there's lots of purple on the, on the screen. So across all the environmental indicators, uh, the key contributor is the manufacturing of the anti-aging cream in purple, which is done by the uh, customer. So again, the biggest hotspot lies outside of Croda's gate, lies downstream with the customer. And again, we can zoom, zoom in into any um, environmental impact um, indicator and see exactly what drives this. So here you'll have the information on climate change impact of the of one application of anti-aging cream in CO2 grams of CO2 per application. And you can see really that when we say the impact sits with, with the customer with the manufacturing of the anti-aging cream, the biggest source of, of this impact is actually over 57% of the impact comes from the packaging alone. Um, and this, you know, by, by kind of collaborating with our customer uh, and making them aware of this, this big impact, it's one action that can change drastically the, the, the footprint of environmental footprint of the product. And it will weigh more than anything else that we can do with our own operations or upstream. Um, and the second biggest contributor sitting with our customer is the different raw materials that they use, the emollients, emulsifiers. So um, changing the formulation of the anti-aging cream to use different raw materials might change, might improve the environmental impact of, of, of the product. However, still the biggest change they can make is in the packaging. And hopefully this is not surprising, you know, when you really think of, of a face cream, even if it's a mass produced rather than a high end product, uh, oftentimes you get 50 grams of, of, uh, of the product in, in the packaging that uh, is not recyclable, contains mixed, uh, mixed uh, materials and oftentimes weighs three, four times more than the actual product that you're buying. Uh, so changing to refillable um, containers or different materials for the packaging will deliver the biggest impact. Um, and really here, beyond just engaging with our customer uh, and targeting the, uh, the areas of, of maximizing um, environmental improvements, we can also kind of zoom back in and, and look at the processes that are within our, that are within our direct control. Um, so here um, you will see the climate change impact on a cradle to gate basis. So this is associated with, with the sourcing of our raw materials and the manufacturing of our um, anti-aging active ingredients. And again, what contributes to that? Is it energy intensive? Is it transport intensive? Is it raw material intensive? Um, so you can see that the key raw materials that we're looking at, those uh, raw material one and two, um, they make around, they account for around 24% of the overall impact uh, on a cradle to gate basis. However, there's other raw materials um, that uh, contribute a lot more, so they should be on our focus. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, with raw material one and two, there's different options to manufacture them and potentially going on a completely different route. Um, so we can go further into detail and see per kilogram of raw material following each of the three processes, what will be the environmental impact um, of, of these raw materials. And this is really important because, for example, raw material one stores through process B, it's not, you know, it's not really impactful, um, it's not a big component of, of, of the environmental footprint of our product. However, we're using this raw material in other ingredients. So by really understanding it, its impact, um, we can kind of sort of getting an idea of how it will um, translate into impacts into other products that we're manufacturing. And the third case study, it uh, looks at um, a formulation aid that is used um, for crop care treatments. And here um, through the study, we're basically looking to, to demonstrate the, the importance of feedstock selection um, in the environmental performance of the product. So um, the, the product is, is a polymeric dispersant that is used as part of 
pesticides uh, to ensure uh, the active ingredient uh, in the pesticide is, is uh, equally spread and targets the area that we want to treat as part of the crop. And um, conventionally, this raw material, this uh, polymeric dispersant, our ingredient, is manufactured from uh, petro-based raw materials, so raw material one and two, which are petro-based. Um, and we wanted to see if we switch to bio-based alternatives, so the same raw materials, but from a bio-based feedstock, how will that translate in terms of um, environmental impacts and benefits and the overall environmental performance of the product? So again, the manufacturing of our ingredient, it being incorporated into the pesticide and then being used by the farmer uh, to treat the crop um, and looking at two different scenarios. And the functional unit is one hectares of wheat treated for a specific disease, in this case, brown rust. Um, and the question is, we want to identify what's the importance of feedstock selection in the environmental performance of the polymeric dispersion. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a big part of our raw materials are bio-based and we're looking to further transition to even more bio-based raw materials. And so we need to understand, are there any trade-offs in doing so? Um, and again, the key study parameters. Um, so really downstream, everything is the same. The only thing that has changed is how we um, constrain the petrochemical and the plant-based feedstock for the petro-based and the bio-based system. And again, to make sure we're comparing apples with apples. Um, and what we've seen is that for raw material one, moving from petro-based to a bio-based feedstock um, actually leads to a, to a decrease in, in the carbon footprint. So you'll see here the climate change impact in kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of the bio, uh, bio of the raw material. Um, and you will see a, a decrease, and this is associated both with uh, the material consumption, but also uh, the bio-based uh, raw material is, is less energy intensive. Um, so that's, in a way, you know, what we're hoping to see, but it's not generally true. So not all uh, transitions from petro-based to bio-based will have a positive climate change impact. And raw material, too, kind of showcases this alternate scenario where if you move from petro-based to bio-based, what you see is an increase in the climate change impact. And uh, even though the process of making the bio-based raw material might be less energy intensive, so you see a reduction in the impact associated with the electricity and natural gas use, overall you're using more feedstock, um, more a bio-based feedstock to generate this second raw material. Um, so that means the impact coming from the feedstock is higher. Um, however, because we can track down really what is the cause of, of each impact, we no, now know that if we, if we look at sourcing the raw material too from a different feedstock that maybe has a higher sugar content, it, it will have a better yield, um, this means we can actually have a bio-based raw material too with a lower carbon change, uh, with a lower climate change impact. So again, this is not just a, an absolute truth, but it, it offers us the opportunity to reverse engineer the processes and see how we can further improve each stage to really uh, generate the, the desired environmental uh, benefit that we want. Uh, and again, these are the results of the petro-based uh, this person and the bio-based this person across all the um, environmental indicators. And again, we can kind of isolate that most of the impacts are driven by the feedstocks. Uh, so changing to bio-based feedstocks um, will, will drive the, the, the changes that we see. So rather than the bio-based raw materials being more energy or waste intensive, no, this is not the case. It's just that the impacts of the feedstocks are, are bigger. And what you see here, is basically a comparison between the fully petro um, dispersant in red, the fully bio dispersant, uh, so with raw material one and raw material two um, being bio-based in green, and then some uh, intermediate scenarios where we only switch to bio-based for raw material one or only switch to bio-based for raw material two. And here in this radar chart, you can see the, um, the performance of each scenario um, against each environmental indicator. So the, the 
the higher the impact for the, each respective indicator, that means the worse the environmental performance is. So you, what you want is basically, is you wanna be as close to zero as possible. So everything that is on the outside, on the 100% mark is uh, the scenario that has the biggest impact. So performs the worst in terms of uh, environmental performance. Um, so what you'll see here is actually that the fully bio-based scenario uh, will perform worse than the intermediate or the petro-based scenarios um, for environmental indicators like acidification or uh, freshwater eutrophication uh, or um, terrestrial eutrophication or land use. Um, and why that is, it's, it's really because um, of the way that these uh, raw materials are, are, these feedstocks are being sourced. Um, so what happens is um, we, with bio-based feedstocks, it involves uh, crops being grown. Uh, and uh, these crops, you know, might uh, employ methods of, uh, of industrial agricultural production uh, that requires extensive land, water, and energy, and pest fertilizers and pesticides. Um, so increasing the demand for bio-based raw materials uh, may compete with food production, and may drive intensive farming, ultimately leading to conversion of forests and grassland and so on. However, um, Again, this is not the ultimate truth. We see, as you can see from the bio-based raw material one and raw material two, so the intermediate scenarios, you see that depending again on the feedstock that you choose, um, you, you will, your system will perform better or worse. Uh, so what that helps us understand is really pinpoint what are the crops that perform better? What are the crops where we can mi minimize any trade-offs, where we can achieve lower carbon footprint and lower a land use and lower water use and so on. Um, and something that really I want to emphasize here is that um, sustainable sourcing is not fully captured as part of LCA. So right now, all the efforts that we're doing to, to source our raw materials sustainably, um, which will lead to lower land, lower water and everything, they're not really uh, captured by this data. So if anything, that the picture is, is better uh, than what's shown here for sustainable sourcing. Uh, and ultimately, how do we add value to this data? Um, really, if you look at the, uh, at the impact on the cradle to gate and the cradle to grave um, system boundary, there will always be products that you know, will score better on the cradle to gate. Um, so will have minimum impact for us um, and kind of have a higher impact for our customers. So in that case, we need to kind of consider really what are the merits of, of this ingredient in the application area and start collaborating with customers to understand um, and target environmental improvements downstream. Um, there will be products which will perform very well downstream. Uh, however, it, will, it might take a lot of energy uh, and resource on our end to, um, to manufacture. So in that case, really we need to consider the um, inherent chemistry and how we can improve it and how we can stay ahead of regulation and, and target innovation. Um, there will be products that perform very well on a cradle to gate and a cradle to grave basis, um, in which case, you know, these are the products that generate benefits in use like the, the uh, biopolymer and fabric conditioner. So in that case, we want to work with our customers, quantify and demonstrate the environmental benefits of these ingredients and maximize them through consumer education. And there might be products that are very, are performing poorly, no matter at what system you look at. Um, so they definitely not uh, in line with our purpose. And this kind of uh, LCAs, you know, it will help us uh, steer our product portfolio um, so that we're more aligned with, with what we want to achieve. I think that I'm running out of time. Uh, so I just want to conclude by saying that if by 2050, we want to be net nature positive, net zero, uh, we want to have a thriving circular economy model uh, where nature is restored and, and, and resources being used uh, sustainably, what we need is full supply chain transparency. We need to get all the players across the value chain aligned and synchronize efforts uh, from the suppliers to the consumers. And the, one of the best ways to do that as a starting point, at least, is through LCA. Um, I think that gets me to the end. A couple of acknowledge acknowledgements um, for the lovely members of, of, of the CRODA sustainability team. And I think it's time for questions. <laughs>
Antonio, many thanks indeed. That's been a, a particularly interesting uh, a way to spend uh, uh, time this afternoon. And as uh, someone who is uh, not necessarily a, um, a believer in the uh, concept of fast fashion, uh, to hear that I could actually double the lifetime of my clothing is something of particular interest. Yeah, it's so, perfect. <laughs> So um, let's uh, have a look at, uh, we've got a few questions we come in. So, um, right, let's start us off. What is the LCA software that you use to quantify all these impacts? Yes, so we've built our own tool, which is Excel-based. Um, so what, what that means is really it's, it's operating like CIMA Pro, but in an Excel format, um, and it's, it's modular. So that means really we can add as many, data inventories as we want, model different uh, functional units. Um, and uh, so it's really the same approach as with CIMA Pro, but more manageable um, internally. Because again, as I said, we want to kind of own this whole process. Okay. Um, um, so we will be using emission factors from eco -invent, um, and we'll be incorporating this and multiplying the emission factors with the data we collect to generate results, but it's all in a more user-friendly, way i think thank you um do you have target percentages for Crowder's contribution to the impacts listed and how do you define that your impact is limited sorry can you say that again yes sure do you have target percentages for Crowder's contribution to the impacts listed and if so how do you define your impact if limited uh, we don't have targets uh, around really what our impacts is, are. We we have, before we, we started our LCA work, we have targets around uh, climate and land positive where we want to save more land than the land used to grow our raw materials and we want to save more carbon than the carbon used to generate our ingredients. Um, so ultimately, we're kind of using these LCAs to, to build up to meet those separate targets that we have, but at the product level, no, we don't. Ultimately, we want to use that matrix to identify the products that are in line with our uh, purpose and really maximize their performance, drive innovation in that area, drive opportunities to collaborate with customers and kind of identify you know, the, the black sheep that we should kind of uh, consider when we manage our product portfolio. Okay, thanks. How do you account for uncertainty? It seems like 2% would realistically be lost in the error bars. Uh, yes, so the um, the uncertainty is that related to the climate change, uh, sorry, with the coal type, with the biopolymer um, case study. Um, that is basically how we're, we're looking at that through the sensitivity analysis, first of all, um, to see, okay, really, if we extended the lifetime of clothes by less than 10%, how much would it change and would that variation be higher than the um, and the than the uncertainty of the data? Um, ultimately, by using, as I said, by using primary data, um, that means good quality data, which will limit any um, any of the you know, uncertainty that we have. So between between using good quality data to fully uh, model the different life cycle stages and then testing through sensitivity analysis all, all the areas of uncertainty. Um, yeah. yeah. What is the environmental impact as persistent organics in oceans comparison between washing particulates for 100% bio-based textiles, natural fibers, and textiles with a mixture of pet chem fibers and natural or new bio-based textiles? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. you'll have to repeat that again. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting rather concerned about uh, timing on this as well. So, what is the environmental impact as persistent organics in oceans? Compa the comparison between washing particulates for 100% bio-based textiles, natural fibers, and textiles with a mixture of pet chem fibers right. and natural or new bio-based textiles. So, in in the study, we've kind of uh, modeled um, when we say clothes are being thrown away, we're looking at a certain set of, of, of mixed fabrics, including cotton and uh, polyester fibers. So that will be specified in the key uh, parameters of, of the study. So really, again, because we're working on, 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 on this 
assumptions generated from, from the consumer surveys, uh, we can't model exactly each type of fabric and, and the impact that it will have. It's more of an, of an average as representative of most of the clothes. Okay. How, how is Croda involved in educating the general public to change consumer behavior and raising the environmental understanding? Um, that's a really great question. Really, as, as I said, oftentimes, because we're business to business, uh, we don't have access to the end consumer. And that's where the opportunity to kind of share this expertise with our customers who are more in contact with, with the consumer, um, that's where the value is, because together we can work um, to reach out the end consumer. Okay. All right. Um, well, looking at the timing, I think, let's see whether we can get to another couple of questions in. Uh, would a micro dot identification built into plastic packaging help to get more recycled if the waste receiving station could read the dots and automatically sort the waste? Um, I, I guess, again, this is a very specific question. When we, um, especially when we model the consumer stages, we are using averages for the respective geography that we're modeling. So um, when we're looking at the packaging and the materials used for the packaging of the fabric conditioner or whatnot, there are um, kind of um, statistics that will tell us how much is being recycled. And, and that's what we're working with. Okay, and uh, I'll have to take this one as being the final one for the afternoon. Apologies to, the, to the, those that I haven't get around to uh, asking, but this looks a very good understanding of the factors contributing to each impact type. However, is there any non-subjective way of balancing the desirability different impacts, e.g. any way of saying how much land might be worth sacrificing to save a kilogram of CO2 emissions? Uh, very good question. Um, as of now, no. And really, um, the ISO standards encourage us to steer away from prioritizing one impact over the other. So kind of justifying that it's worth doing land damage because it, it decreases that you know, X amount of, of CO2. So it's quite hard. There will be uh, certain environmental indicators that are more easy for, for stakeholders, for companies to work with. So like we gave the example of land use, you know, it's more tangible than things like, I don't know, freshwater eutrophication. Um, however, this should be really treated as a, a view over the whole picture and, and a way to kind of identify the areas where you can minimize the trade-offs um, rather than saying it, it, it's worth going for it. it. It will always be debatable. You know, what's important for, for me and for our company might be viewed very differently by other stakeholders. Antonia, many thanks indeed, and many thanks to all, to all those who've um, asked questions. And as I said, apologies to those I didn't get around to. Okay, so in conclusion, you can see why uh, everybody should be uh, joining up for SCI membership. Um, and I'd now like just like to bring your attention to uh, our future SCI talks. So if you could, um, the next one being 28th of June, where we're looking at building a waste-free world with seaweed. Then, in, then we take a break for the summer and back in the autumn for three discussions, Women in STEM, a better workplace for everyone, moving the needle on equality, diversity and inclusion, and then transitions in science, phase and gender. So uh, please uh, you know, consider signing up and uh, coming along to these webinars uh, next month and also during the autumn. Okay, and with that, I'd once again like to say Thank you very much, Antonia. Thank you very much, audience, for coming along this afternoon. And uh, have a good evening. Bye for now. Very much. Bye, everyone.